Holy Gospel, our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we do not know, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old, Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear the sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be, Nicodemus said. You are the Lord's teacher, Jesus said. And you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the son of man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the son of man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save them, the world, through him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord, Lord Christ. Christ. Take my lips, O Lord, and speak through them. Take our minds and think with them. Take our hearts and set them on fire. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning again. Another wonderful day in paradise, right? Right, yes. Today is the second Sunday in Lent, and we are continuing the stewardship series, which is based upon generosity. Particularly, I am talking about the impact of ministry using the gospel lesson today with Jesus and Nicodemus and the discussion they had between each other. I find great empathy with Nicodemus. He was a good man, an intelligent, sensitive, strong leader in his community, and an active participant in weekly worship. He may have been wealthy, but he didn't show up. He certainly wasn't poor. So let's call him upper middle class, and someone recently described him as the patron saint of seekers. The patron saint of seekers. Nicodemus encounters Jesus, and his whole life is thrown into turmoil. He is unable to deny that he senses the presence of God in Jesus, even though it contradicts everything in his, religious, his religion has taught him. Some things take more effort to deny than they do to admit. Nicodemus couldn't deny what he sensed, but neither did he have the courage to raise the question in public. Like Nicodemus, our deepest questions about authentic faith, about life and death, about meaning and purpose, remain unspoken, and as long as they do, we, like Nicodemus, remain pr profoundly unsatisfied. A fault line stretches between what he professed in daylight among his friends and other people and what he wondered about at night. Nicodemus lived along that false line, fault line, and so do we. As the people of California know all too well, fault lines sometimes give way to what? Earthquakes. The ground trembles with Nic within Nicodemus. The good man shakes because the scripture he has known since birth is coming alive in strange, dangerous ways. He can't deny what he feels in the presence of Jesus, so he follows his question to the source. Shall we, gazing upon Nicodemus, the patron saint of seekers, follow our questions 
and help until they bring us to the source of light. Under the cover of darkness, Nicodemus may have assumed that he could keep the conversation with Jesus on his terms. He would go home with his questions answered and his life undisturbed. Then he could get back to his normal religious life. But Nicodemus finds his questions have led him to the most vulnerable place, new life at an old age. Why such riddles, uncontrollable winds that roar through the soul and fill your life with the Holy Spirit? What's going on here? Wait a minute, sir. What do you have done with my religion? Jesus speaks of a new birth from the Spirit, and we with Nicodemus are induced into labor. Any woman who has given birth knows that neither the labor nor the birthing is without pain. Nicodemus quickly discovers that he can't control his encounter with Jesus or with God or even his course of this life. What on earth are you talking about, he asks Jesus in desperation. Jesus' language doesn't make sense, so Nicodemus resorts to liberalism, the last stronghold for those who would keep religion in a religious box. How can I rent to the room, he asks. Literalism has a way of keeping things safe on the page or in the head, but it's certainly not in the heart. But Jesus is not interested in a safe religious conversation, not then and certainly not now. He is, inter in, he is interested in the transformation of your life and mine. The Nicodemus who lives within me trembles because I know that to believe seriously in Jesus is to yield to everything, to lose my religion and to be born again. This is risky business. How can this be? Nicodemus cries out in holy labor, indeed, how? Do you see the top of the little head coming down and now nearly being born from the spirit's womb? Jesus speaks, and we who would be born again listen. No one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. The fault line cracks right down the center. Grace, grace shatters the fetters of safe religion. He says the most radical of things, if you believe in me, you will emerge from the womb of the spirit, wet with the newness, newness of life. A whole new person you'll be. And we cry out, how can this be? Nicodemus was schooled in the way of religion and civ civic virtue, and so are we. Nothing in religion or virtue can prepare you adequately for an encounter with the Holy One. All that is required is a willingness to believe that God of Scripture may also be present in our lives. The willingness to believe that love revealed itself in Jesus. Nicodemus stands there in the night and feels the wind blowing across his face. Do you suppose that this is all that is required of you to be born again? Not once, but again and again. Is this all that's required to come timidly by night or to come boldly in the, in the day and ask God, how can this be? How can it be that you or any of us are nursing secret hurts and fears, nagging insecurities and embarrassing private sins can ever change? <coughs> we have grown old as we are. How can we be anything else? This is the heart of the matter, isn't it? Believing that you can be born anew, but a short distance from believing in the one whose love is capable of saving you. That belief will send you shooting right out of the womb into new life. Salvation is what the ancients called this lifelong process of being made whole in God. It's has invited Nicodemus to accept it's what Jesus invites you and me to accept here today. Grace shatters you and leaves, you, you, leaves your safe religion in pieces. Don't bother putting it back together. Jesus said love blows into our lives with the power to make us whole. We are also summoned to believe and to cast our lives confidently upon God, who is capable of transforming everything, even you and me. Jesus concludes his talk with Nicodemus with the famous piece of scripture, which most of us can recite by heart. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Then Jesus concludes with, indeed, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through 
him. That leads us to the ministry of the church as we know it today. In our baptismal covenant, we are asked, do you promise to follow and obey him as your Lord? And what's the answer to that? What's the response to that? I do. Then the congregation as a whole is asked, will you who are witness these vows do all in your power to support this person in his life or her life in Christ? And again, we all respond, we will. will. That to me is our call to ministry. A great, defini a, a great definition of ministry is this. Ministry is meeting human needs with God's resources. Let me say that one more time. Ministry is meeting human needs with God's resources. What are some of the needs that those around us, or even ourselves, have in some case? There are people around us who are hurting. There are people around us who are ill. There are people around us that are hungry. There are people around us that are lonely. There are people around us that are tired. People that are discouraged. People that are lost. And people that are scared. And the list goes on and on. As a member of the body of Christ, and especially St. Mary's, we can help meet these needs. We have to train ourselves to recognize the opportunities to help and to take advantage of it. We need to strive to have the mind of Christ. We need to meet people's needs with God's resources. That's what we're called to do, and that's ministry. Why are each of us called to ministry? Because of the impact our gift of ministry can have on the life of a person. Because we know that Jesus' ministry transformed Nicodemus, and he calls each of us to do the same. There's one thing I can absolutely guarantee here this morning. God still works miracles even today. How many believe that? How many believe that God still works miracles today? Amen. Day in and day out, we experience what I call God incidences. You'd be so tired of that, aren't you? I've been saying that for what, the last nine years. God incidences. What's another term for that? Anybody else know another term? God winks. How many of you read that book, God winks? You need to get that book. It's a pretty good book. But I call them God incidences. I was there first, so that, that works. <laughs> Many people see it as luck. I had a good friend named Father Tom White, and, and we worked together doing uh, youth ministry for about uh, five or six years. And Tom was really, he was a young guy, and he was really funny. So I, sometimes I said, boy, that was lucky. And he said, what? What'd you say? What'd you say? He said, there's no such thing as luck. I challenge you to look at your life for the next week and identify those experiences where, which are God-inspired. You will be amazed. God still impacts lives for the ministry of his committed followers. Just think, every life we encounter is being transformed as a miracle in progress. And as a community, we are being called to continue to impact lives with grace and the love of Jesus Christ shown in our lives and in each of our ministries. What are some of the ministries that make up St. Mary's? God is calling some to the service on his altar, as we had here this morning. God is calling others to, as Eucharistic ministers and visitors. God is calling a lot of us to go sing in the choir. Right, choir? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right. Th we need more volunteers. Get up there. <laughs> have we got any more seats back here? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, we have one more seat. Does anybody here want to volunteer? <laughs> God is calling others to lead small groups. God is calling others to the ministry of Christian education and youth groups. God is calling others to serve in our vestry or other committees in the church. God is calling others to build building ministry. God is calling others to healing ministries and caring ministries. God, God is calling us to evangelistic ministries. God is calling others to the office ministry in Mary's closet, in Mary's kitchen, in Mary's library. And the list goes on and on. God is calling others to the Daughters of the King or Stephen's ministry. God is calling others to ministry of outreach here in Stewart, across the state and throughout the world. Just think about the backpack buddies and the impact we have on those kids at that school. It makes quite a difference. I'm sure you get the picture. There are many callings and ministries which are essential to our church functioning as the body of Christ. As the fact of that each of us is called to whatever form of ministry that God has planned for us. And guess what? Each one of us is part of the body of Christ. And in Christ's body, there are no parts that do not have a job, a ministry to perform. 
It is our commitment to Christ in, in the area of service. I believe that God provides the talents and skills for those ministries that God wants to have happen. I believe that God has called you and me to use those talents to serve in the Lord's name. Mary, St. Mary's is far stronger if people are serving where they feel called by God to serve. If you feel that God is calling you, just say, yes, Lord, what do you want me to do? What do you want to do through me? We have a mission to accomplish for the Lord, and you are a vital part of making that mission happen. You are gifted by the Holy Spirit, and that gift, that particular sets of talent and abilities that you have are vital to making Mary, St. Mary's a life-changing and life-giving experience to each and every one of us and to all who come through that door. Nicodemus, when each, the Nicodemus within each of us leaps as the words return full circle and become full of life. This is to be born again, to believe in God's love for you so generously displayed in Jesus Christ. Love graciously given, love freely endured, the agony of love lost. Believe this and you will be born again and again and again. And you will change the world and you will ultimately bring it to Christ. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.